This is a series where once a month uh, a member of the faculty is going to talk about a contemporary issue to the Brooklyn Law School community. And to kick off the series, we have Professor Sabil Rahman, uh, one of our colleagues who's joined Brooklyn Law School in 2015 and has been doing uh, a lot of work both in his research, in his writing, in his teaching on the issues of inequality and democracy. Um, there couldn't be, I think, more uh, perfectly timed issues uh, for us to think about as we begin the school year, as many of you begin your studies of law. Um, and uh, it's perfect timing in another sense, too. Uh, Professor Rahman is going to take a leave of absence uh, for a short time from Brooklyn Law School to head DEMOS, a public policy organization that works on these issues of uh, inequality and democracy. So we're really fortunate to have him here with us today before he takes his leave. The idea of today's presentation is that there'll be a short discussion, maybe 15, 20, mi 20 minutes, setting the stage, raising some issues, and then it'll turn into a more interactive session where you can ask questions, brainstorm about opportunities, and otherwise comment on uh, the topics that have been discussed so far. So without further ado, if you'd help me welcome Professor Rachman. Okay, great. Um, okay, can folks just, okay, how's this for volume? Okay, great. Um, so I'm so happy to be here. It's so great to see uh, friends, uh, colleagues, uh, students, uh, who, many, who many, I see many uh, folks who I've, I've had before uh, and some new faces, so this is great. And thank you, Dean Fullerton, for uh, kicking off this series. I think we're all, we were all very excited when you first broached the idea about this, and, and I'm uh, glad to be a part of the, the, the kickoff of this whole series for the year. So um, uh, and as Professor Fullerton mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm at this uh, transition point myself where I'm taking on uh, this other hat. Uh, and so this is particularly well time for me to sort of think about the interactions between the legal academy, the classroom, uh, and the larger fights that are, that are being waged right now about law and inequality uh, and the state of our democracy. And so I want to talk a little bit about that uh, today and then hopefully open it up to uh, some, more, some more discussion. So um, I think that the title of the talk uh, that we, we framed, uh, I think, is Structural Inequality uh, and Social Movements. Um, and so I, so, so I want to kind of talk about two things. Uh, first, th what is this idea of structural inequality? It's an area that I've done a lot of research on and that a number of folks uh, on the faculty have also been working on. Uh, and second, then, what does it mean to sort of approach a, 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 a theory of law and social movements and social change uh, in context of structural inequality? So, so what do we mean by, by structure? Um, I think we've, we're all pretty familiar by now with some of the critiques, right, about income inequality, but also about uh, longer term systemic patterns of uh, structural racism, uh, race and gender inequality, the many different ways in which our polity, our society is, is really a tiered one, right? We have uh, various levels of uh, membership in the society that is uh, you know, not uh, a product of formal law necessarily, although in some cases it is, um, like some of the fights about immigration right now, but, uh, but in many cases there, it's a product of these uh, hidden background systems of law that effectively create second, third, fourth class citizenship for a lot of members uh, in, the, in the broader polity. And so when I think about structural inequality, that's really what I'm interested in. And so to my mind, the, adding the idea structural, adding the, that word to inequality, I think connotes for me uh, really two things. First, an attention to those background systems, rules, policies that produce at a, 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 a sort of durable uh, tiered membership uh, that is sort of resistant to many efforts at change and reform. Uh, and the second thing that structural connotes to me is an idea of power. So systems uh, of law and policy don't just arise, they don't just happen, it's not like uh, the weather, um, although the, we I mean, the weather's also human made at this point, but, uh, but the point is that uh, these systems are human made, and they're a product of law, they're a product of policy, and they're a product of politics. And so when we think about uh, what is sustaining the problem of inequality understood as tiered citizenship, part of the answer to that has to be a political one, that there are political coalitions, political forces, there's a balance of political power that lies behind those rules which lie behind the day-to-day -day experience of inequality. So that's all super broad and, and, and abstract. Uh, let me try to make it uh, concrete with a few examples. So 
And some of the, the work I've been researching lately, uh, hopefully for the uh, one day, the next book project, this is a <laughs> the book project I've been talking about for forever, but still does not yet exist. So, um, uh, but but the idea, one way I've tried to operationalize this is to focus on uh, three dimensions of structural inequality, economic, social, and political. Now this is a little bit artificial, right? Obviously they're all related to one another, uh, but it just helps us organize our thinking. So first, uh, thinking about economic structures. Um, uh, I think Professor Janger is here. A couple of you took our seminar last semester, uh, which was about market structure, uh, and that was in some ways a test drive of some of these ideas about structural inequality and how law constructs markets. So a couple of examples here. Uh, there's a growing body of research that shows that uh, wage inequality and income inequality is increasingly uh, understood to be a product of deeper dynamics in the market where market power is concentrated among a small number of actors. So instead of your, the idea of perfectly competitive markets that have lots of small firms that are competing with one another, uh, what we really have throughout the economy is uh, a few mega firms. And even more importantly in some ways, a few mega investors who own all the mega firms. Uh, and what that means is that their uh, prices are higher, but it also means that wages are lower because for example, if you're a worker, uh, you can't, you don't have as many places to, to, to leave and to go work uh, because the concentration, there's so few firms in the marketplace is a, a problem of monopsony power. Um, and so there's a, there's a connection between this sort of background structure of the market and the day-to-day -day experience of inequality. And law plays a key role in this because part of the story of how we got to a concentrated uh, sort of quasi-monopolistic market in 2018 is the weakening of antitrust regulations, financial regulations, uh, through administrative and, in some cases, statutory action over the last 30-odd years. And so, so this is part of a good example of what I was getting. There's, a, there's a, a political debate that produces a change in policy, that produces a change in economic structure, which then is experienced as an economic boom in which wages have not increased, right? That's the top line that people experience, but there's this whole iceberg underneath that, right, that is uh, lying behind. So that's example one. Um, example two is uh, what I'm thinking of as social structure. So I was listening to the radio this morning uh, and uh, on NPR, and they were talking about uh, the new bill that the city council passed that is uh, trying to reintegrate or better integrate the New York City school system on race and class lines. And so they're redesigning the uh, allocation uh, system, right, for, for students in K through 12. Uh, so now that's a really big deal, why? Because um, well, obviously education is important, but also uh, what we've seen is a gradual, uh, a pretty durable pattern of economic and racial segregation in our cities and in our schools that uh, exists and in fact has uh, continued to thrive despite uh, what, we, what all of you, uh, you know, covered in your first year con law classes and Brown v, the rulings in Brown v. Board, right? Um, and that's partly a product of a whole set of background laws and policies here as well. So think about, uh, so the, the school allocation uh, policy is one example. The other one that I really like, uh, those of you who have taken my seminar, we read some work on this, uh, is policies around zoning and urban planning. So uh, there's really good research that shows that uh, not just wages, but everything from wages to health to uh, lifespan to educational attainment is, is highly determined by one zip code where one grows up and in fact has intergenerational effects. So if you're born uh, in, a, in a high poverty zip code, the hit that that, that accident of birth uh, uh, impacts on your health and your income and your life chances is in fact visible on your children as well. It's a multi-generational effect. There's great research uh, showing this empirically. So that being the case then, that suggests that the, the policies that we have that create pockets of, uh, pockets of poverty, po pockets of um, uh, econ uh, neighborhoods that are then cut off from uh, the, the economic hubs of the city, that that's really, really important for inequality for, and for membership. Uh, but it's not, the, it's not something that is usually on most uh, folks' radar, right, when we're talking about inequality. And so urban planning, zoning, uh, housing policy is a huge part of producing sort of social uh, patterns of, of, of inequality. So that's example two. Um, and I can, we can talk more about each of these as we go forward. Uh, the third example is uh, political, uh, structural political inequality. Um, and this is, uh, this will be, I think, familiar to a lot of, uh, a lot of folks, you know, if we think, if, 
economic and social inequality is a product of policy, well, then it really matters who makes the decisions, right? Who governs the classic question of democracy, uh, of constitutionalism. Uh, and as I think we're all pretty familiar at this point, uh, we have a deep, deep pathology in our democratic system, right? Our, and, and, and in a lot of ways, truthfully, we're probably not well described as a democracy. It's probably better described as an oligarchy uh, at best. Um, we, can, we can talk about other terminology too uh, in the current regime. But, um, uh, and this is not just about campaign finance reform and money in politics, right? That, I think that's the most familiar story. That's a, to me, that is an example of a sort of structural uh, political inequality, right? You have a constituency that has more money and more resources, therefore they have more political influence, therefore public policy empirically, demonstrably uh, furthers their interests over everybody else's. Uh, this is a top 1% story, but uh, in, in newer research, is, which is a little bit more challenging, but I think uh, makes sense, uh, also suggests that this is a top 20% story. So the upper, upper middle class is also part of uh, this durable structural imbalance in political power and therefore in economic and social uh, uh, life chances, opportunities. And that's in some ways a, a much tougher uh, political nut to crack. We can, we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, so, so there's a money and politics channel, which uh, we're familiar with, but there are a bunch of other ones as well. That I want to just flag a few on the political dimension. Um, uh, voter suppression, right? We uh, basic issues about access to the ballot, uh, voter registration, uh, how many polling stations are in different uh, counties, right? Georgia just tried to close a bunch of their uh, polling stations in, uh, in predominantly communities of color neighborhood, uh, neighborhoods. That this was beaten back by by public outcry, but it's just one example of uh, a, a long-term wave of voter suppression. And of course, the ACLU and others have been really huge on uh, on fighting that fight. Um, so voter suppression is a part of it. Uh, another piece that people often forget is uh, what I think of as the pipeline problem. Uh, so if you think about as as a structural systemic matter. What are, who are the individuals who are likely to run for office and who are likely to be appointed to uh, high office? What are their demographic backgrounds? What are their class backgrounds and their sociological backgrounds? You can show a, a decline in uh, elected officials and appointed officials who had, whose occupational background was um, uh, working class, broadly defined. And that correlates pretty strongly, uh, some would argue causally, there's a debate in political science about this, but. Um, I think is pretty convincing. That, that, that links pretty strongly to the shift in public policy towards that favor wealthier interests. And so, so if, if uh, campaign financing and voter suppression is about changing who speaks in our democracy, the pipeline problem is about changing who listens, right? Who is on the listening end of when the people speak? Both of these are systemic, uh, kind of putting their thumb on the scale. Uh, on one side or the other. So these are, these are three big dimensions. I mean, I've covered a ton of ground, but I think uh, the point for me is to just uh, highlight that when we're fighting each of these fights, economic, social, and political inequality, the problem is deeply structural. It's not just the top line policy issue. There's this whole network of law and policy that lies behind it, and there's a whole political fight behind that as well. So then um, uh, let me uh, pivot then to say a little bit about social movements and the current moment, uh, and then I wanna open it up. So. Uh, a challenge of viewing all of these inequalities in a structural lens is that almost by definition, structure is really hard to change, right? It's deep, it's embedded, it's often invisible. Uh, and so at a, at a, as a first pass, right, thinking about sort of what the public impact is of uh, wearing our scholar hats, right? As a, at a first pass, a big part of the challenge is just diagnosis, right? Naming the problem as a structural one, building some of the uh, intellectual and conceptual frameworks around, around that as a diagnosis of the problem. Uh, so that's a big part of uh, the scholarly agenda that you know, I and others in, in, our, in the building have been a part of. Uh, there's a whole great, uh, uh, I think, re renewed interest in the legal academy and legal, legal scholarship more broadly around these questions of structure, inequality, uh, political economy, and I can talk more about that if, if folks are interested to hear more about that. So that's kind of step one, maybe even step zero, right? Um, but, but then what do, how do we actually act on these? And this is sort of where I'm starting to wear a, a bit of my, my new hat and, and my, uh, my current hat, right? Um, there, I think we're in a really interesting moment right now in the social justice, legal advocacy, um, uh, kind of so, social movement space. Uh, a lot of the organizations that are key in the landscape, you know, everything from your uh, uh, labor unions to new worker organizing to uh, move on to uh, National Domestic Workers Alliance. Um, uh, we, there's a long list of organizations, but 
Uh, one thing I think is really interesting is when you talk to movement leaders, increasingly they view the problem in these structural terms and they see the mission as not just winning an individual campaign, say raising minimum wage, but as doing it in a way that changes those background rules of the game and that tries to move, rebalance political power in a more equitable way. Um, so that's great. Uh, what, is, what does that mean? What does that look like? I think that's sort of an open question. Everyone in the field is, is uh, trying to think through, everyone in the practitioner field is trying to think through how do we do that, right? And how do we do that in a way that uh, responds to the immediate uh, fires of the moment uh, as well. Um, I'll mention a couple of things here that are front of mind and then I'll close. Uh, so uh, first, a, a quick uh, vignette or anecdote. If we think back, you know, so when, for, when you did con law, right, we, uh, second half of the class, focus heavily on the 14th Amendment, right? And um, the, the, the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments after the Civil War is in a lot of ways our second founding, right, as a country. When we talk about the Constitution and the founding of the, uh, uh, of, of the core basic structure, it's not really just you know, the 1770s and the 1780s, um, the 1860s were really critical, right? Because that's the first time we actually have a constitutional commitment to actually, on paper anyway, including all, uh, all American citizens in the polity. But what's interesting is when you look at those fights, uh, the radical Republican Reconstructionists coming out of the Civil War had a very sp specific vision about how to, or I shouldn't say specific, had a, had a theory of change about how to alter the deep structure of a slave society. And it wasn't just passing the, re the Reconstruction Amendments. What followed after that was a whole bunch of legislation, uh, early creation of the administrative state in the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, a bunch of efforts to try to then enforce the idea of equality uh, and to try to dismantle those deep structures of economic, social, and political uh, inequality that sort of made up the slave system, right? Um, now, that effort was beaten back, and we saw uh, the rise of Jim Crow uh, as a reinscription of that tiered citizenship that I talked about before. But what I think is important to, and interesting to think about is, you, you know, think about that moment. You're coming out of the Civil War, uh, Lincoln has already been uh, assassinated, and you're thinking through, well, how do we have a, a short window? How do we entrench and then enforce this radical idea of uh, equality, knowing that there is a, a whole slew of social and political actors who are going to come for it? Right, we're gonna to try to dismantle it right away. And the theory, which they didn't fully execute, the theory was we're gonna build institutions. We're gonna build institutions that then have a longer shelf life than any one movement or any one uh, president or any one lawmaker. And that's how we're then going to do the long, decades-long work of dismantling structural inequality. Now, I find that really compelling because when you, when, then when you think about it, that idea of building institutions is echoed in other key moments of uh, transformative equality-promoting equality change. So the Civil Rights Act is a structural institution-building uh, uh, achievement. Same with the Voting Rights Act, right? It's not just the bill, it's Title VI, which created this whole administrative apparatus through which we then uh, enforce equality you know, in the schools and in our cities and everywhere else. It's you know, the DOJ's, uh, uh, until recently, the DOJ's role in enforcing access to the ballot, right? These are institution building moves because the, the, real, the understanding is that structural inequality is so durable um, and so uh, uh, hard to dismantle that you need coercive power of the state and you need long-term institutions that last, outlast any one political campaign. Uh, so I think that's, that's just an idea, it's, an, it's a hypothesis, it's some stuff that I've uh, been writing about lately. Um, as I sort of switch to more of a practitioner hat, that's uh, a theory we're gonna try to put into practice in different ways with colleagues around the, around the landscape. Um, but I think the, the bottom line here, I think uh, I wanna close with maybe a, a couple of, uh, not so much questions, but just things that um, in this forum, thinking about uh, the links between the law school and the larger world of policy, things that uh, are certainly on my mind, but would be maybe uh, worth articulating to be on your minds as well. Um, one is just a personal and professional question, right? Um, structural inequality or any issue that you're interested in is so vast, there are so many points of entry. And I think one of the things that we all as individuals are thinking through, right, um, and especially you as students, uh, what is your point of entry into these larger questions, right? Litigation, advocacy, organizing, policy making, uh, 
uh, or something else altogether, right? There are many, many different ways, but that's a, that's a personal and a professional question, and you're trying on different hats as you're here at the law school, uh, and that's as it should be. That's part of your, your mission here um, as a student. Uh, the second question, I think, is, is more sort of, uh, 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 not personal, but sort of more of a broader question, right, is that if, if we buy this diagnosis that inequality is structural and that, uh, and that structural equality requires institution building and long-term power building, uh, how do we do that in a, in a, when there's always short-term immediate pressures and concerns to win an election, to uh, uh, win or delay a confirmation fight, uh, to do any one of a number of things? Um, I don't have an answer for you there. Uh, maybe you all can come up with some and, and let me know. Uh, but maybe let me, let me stop there and, and toss it to Dean and to, to the room. I don't, I, I don't think I'm going to uh, master this right now. Um, but first, thank you uh, for kicking off the discussion. <laughs> Thanks very much, and if you haven't had a chance to take a, a class with him, you know that you're going to get online when he comes back to the law school <laughs> after his leave of absence and sign up for that uh, class opportunity. But let's just throw it open to the audience. Uh, there's lots of um, food for thought here. Um, as, as you closed, one of the things I was thinking about institution building is the Federalist Society yeah. uh, and yeah. the pipeline yeah. of uh, judges uh, that and other uh, government actors that have been um, developed in, yeah. in that institution slash pipeline. Um, but what I really like to do is hear other people's thoughts about anything that was just said. Uh, comments, questions. Really, really fascinating. Oh, Catherine Kim. Uh, I'm, I'm a visiting law professor here, visiting from the University of North Carolina, where we have a lot, of, where we are kind of ground zero for a lot yeah. of these fights. Yeah. Um, one thing that struck me in your remarks is uh, this idea of democracy as the handmaiden of equality. Um, and what strikes me in this particular political moment is the tension we're seeing between populism and ideas like universal dignity. Um, likewise, your comment about institution building is inherently anti-democratic. Right, it's to build institutions to withstand the current political winds, which may be populist, race baiting, dog whistling, whatever you want to call it. Um, how do you try to reconcile that, whether on an abstract theoretical level or even just on a personal level, yeah. um, this kind of tension? Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, I think we have we have enough time. Should I, should I respond now? Or should we? Click? Okay, yeah. Um, uh, so thanks, Catherine. Um, uh, so this is something that that we've all been thinking about a lot, I think, and wrestling with. Uh, so a couple things that that I'll I'll say about this. I mean, so 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 first of all, um, the the idea the, the the fear about populism especially now is well taken though i i have to confess i, I may be in the minority on this i'm i bristle whenever the the question is is answered a, asked a little bit because um there, to me there's nothing populist about what we're calling populism what we're what we're calling populism now we're usually using it as a shorthand for uh the revival of a white supremacist idea of the polity um, and that's populist in a sense, but it's it's a very specific people, right? Um, and and so what we're really in the middle of is, I mean, of course, and this is your work is, is central in this, right? What we're really in the middle of is a fight over who the people are. And so it's pop. So I think the real question isn't populism versus uh, law. The real question is who's populism, right? And what we have is one vision of populism, which is this is a uh, a white settler democracy that is for one constituency and no one else. And another vision of populism, which is the universal dignity idea. 
Um, and so, so, so that's just kind of as a, as a ground thing. I think, but I think the other part about institution building, you know, I think that's, that's well taken. Um, one of the interesting research developments, sort of linking up the scholarship with those, one of the interesting research developments in political science has been uh, a move, a, a realization among uh, social scientists that they have focused too much on sort of the median voter and mass public opinion as the definition of democracy. And on that definition, you know, then yeah, the whole purpose of institutions is to be anti-democratic. Uh, but there's a move away from that to realizing that um, what's actually going on often is very uh, uh, specific, relatively small constituency, constituencies of interest, you know, interest group organizations that, are, that claim to speak for the people but are not the people, right? It's the Chamber of Commerce, it's the NRA, it's, um, you know, uh, uh, the John Birch Society, right? The, um, uh, these organizations have members, but they don't exhaust who the people are. And so when we're talking about institution building, I think really part of the challenge is um, how do we build institutions that are robust to particular kinds of capture and that are tr more truly representative and inclusive of the whole people, right? And so, so when, when I first joined the faculty, uh, uh, a lot of my research was about this question of participatory governance and uh, the administrative state, and that sort of that research has sort of evolved into this one, uh, but but it's because I'm worried about the exact question that that you asked. Great, thank you. Um, next question, comment, thought. Um, hi, Sabil. Uh, um, so. So Ted, why don't you introduce oh, yourself? Oh, Ted Janger. Um, I was a student of Sabeel's uh, last semester in our uh, <laughs> course in uh, uh, consumer welfare, market structure, and political power. Um, I was the market structure guy. He did the other stuff. Um, and, and that's sort of actually uh, the point I, I, I want to sort of tea, uh, 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 push on a, a little bit, um, which is much of the conversation, we've, you've, the way you've approached it, is from the politics side, yeah. right? Which is to say, how do we, as a movement, as an institutional level, move, uh, uh, move in a system of rough and tumble self-governance towards better policies that limit inequality and serve the general good? Yeah. And what is interesting to me as, about this as a law professor and as, and I think might be interesting to law students, is in all of that, what you are pushing is particular policies. Yeah. Yeah. And what I was kind of kind of ask on behalf of the students is if you're thinking about this as a law student, yeah. how do I become a, where's my comparative advantage here as a lawyer yeah. in being a thought leader in coming up with policies that can be sold by this mechanism that Demos and we all are trying to create. So I guess what I was gonna suggest is, could you give some course yeah. advice um, beyond con law and ad law, right? We know about that. <laughs> as to things that people, that students might be thinking about as they structure their educations over the next couple of years. Yeah, that's, that's great. I appreciate the question. To, and um, uh, there are a couple of folks in the room who, who I've, have heard me have a version of this, uh, discuss a version of this question, right, in, in office hours and in, in the classroom. Um, so uh, a, a couple things about this. I mean, first of all, I think um, when we're, in the, we're, when we're, when we're in, in the thick of, you know, you're in the thick of classes, right, there's so much reading and you're just absorbing all this stuff, um, uh, it can be a little hard to sort of realize exactly how much you're learning and how distinct your, uh, uh, your, your thinking and analytical abilities will be once, you, once you're all wrapped up. Because it really is distinct. So as you, once you, when you leave the hallways, right, um, one of the things that's striking is that I think lawyers have an institution, an, in, an institutional mind that is quite different from policy people and quite different as well from sort of political people and from, you know, whatever, like in the, large, in the larger sort of political landscape, the ability to think about law, about rules, about how rules uh, play out, how rules can be manipulated and gamed, um, what it means to then construct a different set of rules, right, and how that might play out, right, that, that, is, that is really what you learn in, in, in 1L and, and 2L and 3L, right? 
um, and as you're doing sort of clinical work and other, other projects, you're testing out that, that muscle. Um, and it may not always feel like that, but, but trust me, it's happening. Uh, that's a super, super valuable and, and rare uh, lens. And so I think part of the, the, part of the mission, right, as a law student, my advice would be you know, two things, right? One is just take every opportunity you can to build that muscle, and that means taking different classes, right? Follow your nose where your interests are, the, um, uh, seek out opportunities to like test, the ID, test your metal on the ground, right? Clinics, journals, um, externships, et cetera. And, uh, so that's number one. And then, and then number two, uh, as you think about what a career might look like outside of the law school, cast a really, really broad net because there's, you know, it might be that the thing that grabs you is, you know, a, a familiar legal path. It might be something else, but you won't know unless you put yourself in the position to sort of experience and try out uh, some of those different conversations. And obviously the, all of us in the building here are, are, are rooting for each of you, right, to, to in that process. Um, but, but yeah, I definitely, you know, would say both those things. Great. Should we get should we get some some yeah? Students? How about some uh, student commentary yeah. thoughts? Yes. The microphone is very daunting. Um, my name is Hava, and I have not been one of your students. Um, so I guess my question is: as you're talking about institutions, do you foresee institution building as more of a state by state institutions yeah. um, relevant to like larger issues, but tailored, or federal institutions, or possibly both? Yeah, that's great. That's a great question, Hava. Um, you know, we're 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 sort of in the midst of, a, I think, a, a a revival of interest in the local, right? The cities and states, for I mean, for obvious reasons. But I, but I would argue this has been brewing for a while, um, even before before twenty sixteen. Um, so I think I, I mean, my answer would be both. Uh, but I think that the 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 intellectual history here, the legal history here, is interesting because there's such a close relationship between the state and local institution building, experimentation, innovation, and the federal. Um, so if you go way, way back before the New Deal, before you know, the switch in time in 37, uh, and before all of the sort of creation of the modern federal regulatory state, the real testing grounds for, for things like uh, consumer protection of uh, tainted food and tainted cosmetics, or um, oversight of, mon of the railroad monopolies, um, or you know, name your issue, a lot of the testing ground for that was at the state and local level. And so in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, you saw basically folks in your shoes who were, many of them were lawyers, many of, the, you know, many of them were not, but a lot of them were, uh, saw a problem in the world, were trying to figure out a way to solve it, and trying to find any lever that they could find, and that meant, okay, we're gonna set up a, a, a transparency commission in the Massachusetts, by, authorized by the Massachusetts state legislature. And they're going to compel the railroads to disclose their fee structures and their ownership structures. And then, that, then, then now suddenly you have a generation of, of policymakers who have been trained in that battleground. And they became the first wave of people who were then uh, brought in to build and staff the New Deal agencies. Right, so there's a, there's, a, there's a historical story here, there's an intellectual story here, there's a personnel pipeline story here, right? And so the state, the link between state and federal is actually really quite close. Um, thinking, you know, with Professor Jenger's question in mind, if we're thinking sort of like very personally, practically, I think you take the opportunities where you, where you can and you pursue the levers where you can. And that's true as an individual, that's also true as a social change organization, right? If the levers are state and local, well, you know, by golly, you use those levers. But I think the, the long-term structural uh, lens suggests that you want to do it in a way that you're um, building out lessons that can then be ported further up the scale, right? And so then, so the real question will be, you know, if there's a different uh, Congress and a different administration in two or four or six or eight years, um, how are they, are they going to do everything they need to do to vacuum up all the ideas and all the things that are now being tested out by cities and states and convert that into federal regulation and federal legislation, right? And that, but that means you got, someone's got to do the testing and then someone's got to do the converting. Great, yes. Um, so my name's Joe, I'm a student. Um, I, my question is about, um, is about antitrust policy. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the economic growth that has happened um, sort of as you mentioned earlier, is a bit lopsided. Like now it's going to a lot of what are called superstar firms. Yeah. 
and like Fang, which is Facebook, Amazon, um, Netflix, and Google are all kind of monopolies within their sphere, particularly because they benefit from network effects, mm -hmm. which is the larger that the firm is, the larger they have a network, um, the better that they can um, uh, help their own consumers, right? This is kind of the standard from the Reagan administration that the antitrust standard is not necessarily your market share, but how it affects consumer prices. Mm -hmm. um, and this seems to be sort of a conundrum because the bigger the firms have a network, the better the firms can serve their customers, but the more they are a monopoly in their market share. So what can be done like about antitrust policy? Yeah, so antitrust is, uh, uh, I, see, I see Ted waving excitedly in the corner. Um, uh, uh, great question. This, this, this is, actually, a little bit of uh, background here. You know, so I started off working on participatory governance issues. I then got kind of randomly drawn into this question. I started writing a lot about um, the new monopolies and tech, and, and tech firms. And then that led me to this current project on structural inequality. So I think antitrust is a really good example of exactly this, this sort of structural lens, right? It's not just about the top line, but there's a whole deeper market structure going on. Um, so the FTC actually has launched a, a new series of hearings that is kicking off next week. I'm going to DC to, uh, to participate a little bit in it. And um, uh, they're taking on this question. I think there's a big debate right now, right, in the antitrust world about what to do about the big tech firms. And, and, is a cons and, and do we need to, or how can we change, get beyond the consumer welfare standard um, and bring back some uh, uh, legal language around market structure, concentration uh, as, the, as the actual problem, right? Um, and so some of that is gonna be, if it ever, if it does happen, it'll be regulatory, right? The FTC has the authority right now, if they wanted to, to, um, to enforce antitrust laws pretty stringently on, on Facebook and Google. Uh, uh, Netflix is a platform too, I'm not sure they're, they're quite the, the economic threat that Facebook, Google, or Amazon is, but um, but so, so, so part of it is a regulatory uh, story, right? You could imagine a, a more stricter enforcement regimes on, on their anti-competitive behavior uh, and defining anti-competitiveness in a, in a broader way, right? So it's not just prices, but it's uh, ownership, market structure, influence on supply chains on both sides of, of the platform. Uh, and then there's a statutory question. So you know, some of the conversations I've been in um, and that folks have been writing about uh, is about, you know, do we need to uh, amend the Sherman Act? Right? Or, or update the Sherman Act to have some more specific statutory language around network firms and, and platforms. Uh, but, but we should bookmark that to, to talk more. Great point. Um, I think. Another comment. Liz. So um, I'm Liz Schneider, and um, I teach here and run the SPARE program. And um, I wanted to pick up Sabeel and something that you said about the social movement aspect. Because when you were suggesting a few minutes ago about all the courses and all the, you know, you never know where you're gonna find it and it might be clinics, it yeah. might be. I, I really wanna just emphasize that so much, so many of the courses that you will be taking have a, are taking now or will be taking have a social movement story mm -hmm. as part of their background, whether it's you know race in the law or constitutional law or immigration law, or I teach women in the law, um, what or civil procedure or you know administrative law. I mean, there's barely you know the sort of division that people often say about, oh, you know, sort of the traditional courses versus, you know, other courses is really in many ways a false dichotomy. And this point that you're making, Sabeel, about social movement and structural, I just want to say in whatever it is that you're studying, look for the social movement dimensions and the way in which those experiences you know, have shaped the law. I mean, we had no law. We have a clinic now uh, on LGBT law. Mm -hmm. You know, 25 years ago, there was no LGBT law. Uh, we have courses on sexuality law, didn't exist. 30 years ago, no course in the law school on women in the law 
or the developments that we've seen you know, in immigration law or whatever it is. But I'm just saying, if you pay attention to how the social movement dimensions have really had an impact in terms of changing the law, it's really a perspective that is very important to have because that is also part of what lawyers have brought to the law to translate the experiences of social movement groups into dramatic and often amazing changes in the law. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. It's 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 really important to sort of like keep that in mind. And you know, folks who uh, a couple of folks here who were in my con law class might uh, might recall some of this. When 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 we do our, our con law class, I kind of. Uh, Sometimes talk about it as when you're doing it, especially if you're in a black letter law class, when you're trying to and you're trying to find that lens, um, which can be hard when you have a, you know a gazillion cases to read. Um, it might sometimes helpful to think about sort of the three. Every black letter law class you're doing, or any law class, is is always operating at at least three different levels, right? The one is the doctrinal level, and that's the one that's sort of most visible, right? Case law, precedent. What's the argument that you would make in a brief? Um, and, and that's a level where you know, not everything goes, right? You might disagree with a precedent, but if that's the precedent, you've got to work with it. Uh, and there you're learning how to build arguments sort of in a doctrinal terrain, and you have some room to, to contest and argue and build different doctrine, but not a lot, right? But then there's a second level, which is sort of the, the political and the social level, right? What's the backstory behind these precedents? Um, you know, who, like what, what, who's on which bench and uh, and what was a sequence of historical events that led to this precedent versus that precedent, can, and, and that's sort of understanding what's actually you know, going on behind that. But then there's a, that opens up then the third level, which is the aspirational one, right? What, is, what, what ought the law to be? What is the better system of rules and precedents and, uh, and laws and regulations that we, we imagine? And then, and then how do we sort of then build a new chain of, uh, of historical events that produces the those legal touch points that then shape the doctrine for the future, right? So, so all of this is happening at the same time, and and you know you're racing really fast, so you can't always you know uh, uh, peer under the hood. But every now and then, it's helpful to just step back, you know, pick a case and just read the history of that case and how it came about, right? Um, uh, I'm trained as an intellectual historian, so 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 history is sort of uh, is is usually my go-to. There are different ways to get into this, but um, you know, there's there's an iceberg behind every single case and every single uh, assignment uh, uh, that you have. Great. Hi, um, Celeste, I'm a student. Um, so something that, like, a fear that I have is that we talk about the structural change um, yeah. without talking about the individual behaviors. Yeah. So something that, I, a fear that I have is that we, we're always at the top and we make these changes at the top without going to small towns or you know like these rural areas or small towns in Texas where I'm from and like yeah. speaking to those people so we'll, we'll have changes at the top and then 20 years 30 years down the line these people are still have their isms and we never changed their isms 30 years ago and so the structural changes that we do have we kind of see a, a backwards like there's it's not a revival yeah. of racism right yeah. like it's always been there never yeah, went never anywhere. Left. right so um, like I just have a question of mm -hmm. you know do you see any efforts to not only just do structural change but also to change the mm -hmm. minds of people who are making these votes you know yeah. having these votes so, so where are you from in Texas like? uh, Dallas Dallas and I'm yeah. also from Little Rock Arkansas yeah okay great um, uh, no it's, it's uh, I'm so glad you raised that right because I think it is a, it is a, a challenge I was the reason I was curious where in Texas you're from and so have you uh, you may have come across, uh, may or may not come across, uh, groups, uh, one in particular that comes to mind is a, a two groups, the Texas Organizing Project and uh, Faith in Texas. I'll just give two quick examples about how they operate, because it's sort of on, to your question, on theme of sort of law and, and social movement. So um, Faith in Texas is a, a really interesting community organization. Uh, the, the woman who founded it, uh, Lydia Bean, is um, herself, her, identifies as a progressive evangelical. And her, uh, her theory of change is uh, that we need to build sort of at the individual and community level uh, sort of a completely different self-identification of community and coalition 
uh, in order to sort of be that, that uh, ballast or bulwark for a different kind of uh, politics sorry, in, um, in the state of Texas. And the way she goes about, one of the ways they've gone about doing this is building, uh, forging new alliances between communities of color uh, and white middle and working class voters uh, in the Dallas suburbs. Now, why the Dallas suburbs? Well, if you have, even if you have a blue city, you have a red state, uh, and anything the city does can be preempted by the state. The balance of power in the state legislature, though, is the suburbs. So if you can win enough of a coalition between the city and the sort of suburb exurb belt, now suddenly you can project political power in the state. Um, now, how are they going about building this, this coalition? Um, they did a big project on predatory lending. And they found that uh, for a lot of the white voters, they had uh, problems with debt in their household. But they experienced that as an individual problem. They were, so, they were ashamed about it and they didn't talk about it. And they didn't view it as a collective political problem. In the communities of color, there's a well-developed language about the problem of debt, the structural sort of relationship between debt and inequality, and it was, it was a known shared problem. So what you had is a shared experience between these very different communities, but no sense of solidarity, right? Because the white voters didn't, ex didn't even talk about the problem of being uh, debt ridden. And so a lot of their brick by brick, door by door organizing work is first getting the white voters to acknowledge the problem and talk about the problem of, of debt and what it means for them and then slowly, painstakingly build a multiracial interfaith coalition of, uh, of communities of color and, and, and white suburban uh, Dallas voters. And they were able to, uh, a couple years ago, they were able to defeat an attempt by the st Texas state legislature to preempt a bunch of anti-predatory lending laws uh, that uh, some of the cities had passed. Now, that's one small example of one campaign, one organization in one state, right? So this is like, the project is huge. Um, but I think your point is well taken, and I think you know, part of what excites me about the current state of social movement organizing is, you know, lead is just one example of many. Like, these leaders are awesome, they're amazing, they have such a, a, a tremendous vision about what they're trying to get to, but they are rolling up their sleeves and doing the absolutely backbreaking work of just slow boring, right? Max Weber says politics is a slow boring of hard boards. That's very much true when you're talking about uh, shifting deep, uh, deep identities and, and, uh, uh, and moving to a different conception of we the people, right? So it can't be the air war, right? You need the ground game, uh, but, but that's a lot of what I think is really exciting about that type of work. What an inspiring example. Um, we have time for one or two more comments, questions? Back in the back. I'm so to get the student. Um, I guess I just had a quick question. Um, thinking about change at the local level as the federal level is not exactly um, conducive to that. Um, I then have this fear of the issue of commandeering, just thinking back yeah. to Philadelphia v. Sessions and how that relationship works. And what do you see that relationship direction going now with maybe the federal judiciary not also yeah. balancing things out? Yeah. Um, uh, should, should we take the both comments, maybe? Sure. Before, uh, Is there another comment? I thought we saw another hand up. Okay, so we'll take both yeah. questions, and then Sabil will be able to address Hi. Them. Sorry. My name is Monica. I'm a student. Um, you mentioned segregation in the city and um, education in particularly, and I was wondering, how do you reconcile, for example, preschools that cost as much as yeah. you know a college education a year versus um, kids that are zoned to you know high schools with like metal detectors yeah um, and just your thoughts on like a pragmatic approach I guess I specifically have um, specialized high schools in mind mm -hmm. just because it seems to, well I'm, I'm kind of biased I went to wrong science um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they're tackling, for example, the entrance exam, right? And how, yeah. I just I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that yeah. specifically. Um, that's, both of these are great. Uh, thank you, Sophia and Monica, both. Um, so, uh, so on Sophia's question about commandeering, um, right, this is, we're, we, we, are, we are barreling full steam ahead towards a, a reckoning uh, with, uh, uh, with Prince and New York v. US and, um, uh, and all of these sort of uh, con law, you know, 101 um, commandeering cases. So this, is, this Fed stock has been on my mind with Kavanaugh, uh, the Kavanaugh uh, nomination, uh, and this is a good example of it, right? I think um, 
you know, for, for, the, for the conservative legal movement, it's a real moment of truth, right? You spent 30 years arguing for uh, a, a specific idea of federalism on constitutional grounds, which you, you know, one may or may not agree with, but there's a good faith argument for why uh, commandeering exists as a doctrine, why we want decentralized governance, uh, going back to you know, Fed 47 and 51. Um, so, but now there's, a, now there's a moment where one's political affiliation is gonna pull, point in a different direction from the existing doctrine, right? Now, instead of red cities and red states uh, against a big, bad, blue federal government, it's the other way around. Um, and, uh, and it'll be a moment of truth for the Kavanaugh's and Gorsuch's of the bench. Um, I am not super optimistic that they will stick to their doctrinal guns, but, I, but we might be surprised. Um, uh, what, so so that's, that's one. Um, but two, I think even if, uh, uh, common, even if sort of commandeering doctrine survives as a, uh, as a protection for state experimentation, say, um, we still then have the city versus state preemption problems uh, that, that we talked about. Um, and so there, there, there are many layers, but um, this is partly why I think when you're out, once you're outside of the, the first round of uh, kind of 1L, right, it's so interesting and important to think about law in conversation with politics and policy, right? Because there's the doctrinal hat and then there's a the political hat and these are in close um, interaction. Um, uh, so, which, so you know, I think in, in a lot of ways the ultimate check is gonna be a political one. Um, uh, not just elections for Congress, but also elections for state, and, uh, for state judges, right? Um, we forget most of our judges in the country are elected and they're elected by the lowest turnout, least regulated, uh, most uh, uh, kind of campaign finance corrupt uh, elections that we have in the country. Um, you know, there's, we have a, a great uh, anti-discrimination law professor in Michigan who's now running for Michigan State Supreme Court. He will, if he wins, he'll be the second um, law faculty on the State Supreme Court, right? Like, and the fact that that's unusual is, is I think, a marker of how easily we forget uh, judicial elections in addition to, to federal ones. Um, about segregation and, and education uh, to Monica's question. So um, it's a great question. And I mean, you, I think you were asking sort of what practically we, we, we should be doing about it. Um, I may not have a super practical, immediate practical answer for you, but, um, but, but uh, your question I think raises a couple of things. So schooling to my mind is a really good example of the, the, long, the, the ripple effects of policy decisions that can be put off as innocuous. Uh, but are actually functionally about uh, uh, a resegregation of the, of the school system in different ways, right? So uh, the privatization of schools, uh, cutting, uh, federal, uh, cutting public sector budgets in general, um, the secession of some municipalities and uh, local communities from others, right? So, so our school is public and integrated, but we, our public is now different from your public because you know, we used to be part of the city and now we're gonna incorporate as a separate suburb. Uh, and so that, you know, our schools can be for our people. That happens, right? That, that's the story of, uh, of white flight in the 80s. So, so, but I raise that to, to highlight that the, the levers, um, there are actually many levers, right? You could imagine, so like finding some way, find, there are different levers that go beyond sort of just a straight kind of equal protection or, um, or uh, anti-discrimination law challenge, right? Can, you, can we think about policies that refuse city, suburb, and exurban uh, uh, districts in ways that then uh, re, can re, uh, reintegrate the school system, right? That, I think that's part of what the New York City Council bill is trying to do in its own way. Um, can we dial up the funding, this funding period? I mean, one of the arguments I think we lost as, you know, in terms of uh, the progressive economic policy is just like equal dignity costs money. And if you care about it, you spend money on it. It's that simple, right? And so you can't expect to cut the bu public sector budget and then be surprised when you know some schools are uh, are you have know, students going through metal detectors and then universal and then pre-K costs uh, you know twenty thousand uh, dollars. The last thing is um, the experimentation with universal pre-K in New York. I think is really really important, um, and it it suggests another sort of front line in the larger debate, which is. Um, can we open up a conversation about uh, public goods that are openly and unapologetically publicly provided on universal and fully funded basis? So Medicare for All is, I think, one example of a much broader conversation that 
if we do it right, should include universal pre-K, should include um, universal child care, uh, should include you know, all these other things that require, that communities need to thrive, that right now you know, families are left you know, on their own you know, uh, out to the wolves, right? Um, so that's not a programmatic answer, uh, but, but it's some directions to, to think about. Well, well, thank you. Um, and before we clap, let me just say a, a couple of uh, closing remarks. Uh, I can't do justice uh, to the, um, the, the multi-layered discussion we've begun, but it's just a beginning. This is the beginning of the semester, the beginning of the school year, and um, so thankful uh, to you for kicking it off. I think there are a couple of things we certainly can take away. Civic engagement, uh, engagement in your courses, in your legal education, taking ownership of that, pushing deeper, and playing the long game. Uh, so with those thoughts in mind, I hope you'll uh, join me in wishing Sabil well as he takes on his new role and also encouraging him to hurry back to Brooklyn Law School. I'll be back soon, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.